So today um, we're going to talk about interview skills. Hopefully, if you've joined me for the last two, which was branding and resume, um, you're getting meetings now because the whole purpose of a resume is to get interviews. But interviews are great. That means that you're you know, doing a great job. It's a numbers game. But interviews, the trick is to turn interviews into offers. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So give me a second to share my screen. Off. Okay. Okay. Everyone see this? Philip, can we see this? We can most okay. certainly. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about, this is an interview workshop today, and um, this is normal times. We hope we're going to be back to normal times um, where we can be in person with people. This looks like uh, more likely what you'll find, um, you know, still for the next few months, um, you know, people meeting like this, or even more, um, more so it's going to be Zoom meetings or over the phone. So we're going to talk about how to get through that, how to interview that in that way. So the agenda today is going to be an introduction to interviews, what happens before the interview, the day of the interview, practice interview questions, um, the after the interview, and resources and next step. So since we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, I'm going to tell you, um, you know, ask you, as always, to please hold your questions to the end. We'll give you, you know, time to ask your questions. Okay. So what's the purpose of an interview? The purpose of an interview is twofold. One is from the employer's standpoint or the recruiter. What are they looking for? It's three things. Can you do the job, which is your skills? What will you do the job, which is your motivation? And this is where the person who, especially if for you know, people who don't have that much experience, sometimes the passion for the job and your excitement can make up the difference and you know, get you ahead of uh, another candidate who seems a little bit less interested and excited. And are you a good fit? Which is always the hardest thing to determine. Are you a good fit for the culture of the, of the company? So that, that's behind the, the questions that the interviewer is going to ask you. And what are you looking for? This is a two-way street. It's not just about, you know, you might feel that way if you haven't worked for a while that you just, you know, you're not going to, um, you'll take anything. But, you know, please don't feel that way because it, all that does is wind you up having to, to look again. So what you're looking for is what's the corporate culture? Um, will I work well with my manager? Who you're reporting to is very important. People leave managers, they don't leave companies. Um, so never diminish that importance. And are there opportunities for advancement? Okay. So before the interview, preparation is key. Your resume, and that's your academic work professional you know, history, we've, we've talked about that on the last one, or you can hear the recording. The job, the job description, the company and the industry, you have to be very familiar with that. And yourself, your personality, interests, values, goals, motivation and accomplishments. And this is all, um, we, we spend an hour on this in the personal branding section. Um, I always suggest when you're going to do a, a phone interview or over the, you know, um, over the computer, that you have these things in front of you. You have your resume in front of you. You have a job description in front of you, and you might, you know, notes about how you your skills link up to what that job description is. So you want to know yourself. You want to identify key skills, abilities, knowledge, and personality traits that highlight you especially in, in, um, in line with what that recruiter is looking for. 
you want to also develop examples that demonstrate the above. So, um, it, you know, it's really important. It's, it's not, not just to say, I work well with people, but have an example of how you did that. And, and you do that through the power of storytelling, which we're going to uh, briefly talk about here um, a little bit later, because that reinforces your brand. So as a recruiter, the only way that I'm going to know how you're going to do, how you're going to work in the future, if I hire you, is to know what you've done in the past. And, and so you have to demonstrate that to me with the story. Remember, you know, folks, that as a recruiter, um, which I spent a lot of my life doing, I, I'm at risk too. You're not the only one at risk. I don't want to make a mistake. So you have to convince me that, you know, you are who you say you are and you're the right fit. This is something to think about. I don't think a lot of people discuss this, but I think it's very important to think about possible red flags in advance. So what are red flags? Reason for leaving. You should know and be able to speak smoothly about your reason for leaving. Now, the good news, there's not too much good news about COVID, but the good news is that a lot of people know that, you know, because of COVID, a lot of people were let go. Um, they, you know, careers, if you were in the, you know, the performing arts or um, event planning, a lot of these are just not, you know, that, that those were at a dead stop. So that's not so difficult. But if you're in a field where had nothing to do with COVID um, and for some reason, let's say you didn't go get along with your boss or something that was more um, performance-based, you really need to work that out and be able to tell that smoothly. When I worked for um, Right Management, which was one of the big outplacement um, fields, the first thing we worked with with candidates is their reason for leaving because you don't want to raise any doubts that with some kind of a personality or some kind of a lack of skills. So that's what you should think about. Gaps in resume. This is hard to get around. Um, the only way to, you know, sometimes it's, you can hide it a little in your resume by putting your most relevant jobs first and then all your other professional experience after. But it's, you know, at some point it's gonna come out. So you should have, you know, you can't make up for the gap, but you might, say that if you were working, if you had a gap and you were doing something that filled the gap, let's say you, um, like a lot of women have gaps for child to, to raise their children, but they were involved in the P PTA or some voluntary experience. It doesn't have to be work, it doesn't have to be paid work, but it's something that you were doing that looks productive. So think about how are you gonna answer that, uh, that question. You're overqualified. You know, we're going to have a lot of, you know, a lot of um, more older people are going to be in the job market now. And, you know, they all say I'm willing to take anything or I'm willing to take something that I'm way overqualified for. But employers are going to question that because their feeling is that you're going to be bored. You're going to leave, even though you swear to them that you won't. But, there, you know, there's ways to get around, you know, that saying that, this is, you know, you're at a different stage in your career. It's really about the job. It's, it's, you know, you 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 think the company is great and you're going to be able to prove yourself. And I always like to say, I'm not overqualified, but I'm more than qualified, meaning that the employer is going to get more bang for their buck if they hire you. And then the other end of the spectrum is lack of experience, which is always, you know, the catch-22. They say you want experience, but they won't hire you. So how are you going to get the experience? But sometimes you've had that experience. It might not be for a paid job. Um, Pace is very strong. If you, you know, went to Pace undergraduate, you know, maybe you had an internship or maybe you did the same kind of work in a volunteer basis. It doesn't really matter sometimes if you've done it for pay, but if you had that type of experience they're looking for, you might be able to make up for um, that argument that you, you lack experience. Okay, so, but I, but it's very important to think about those. Don't put your head in the sand because when they ask you these questions, which you know they're going to, they're going to have them down, have your answer down as smoothly as you can. 
Okay, this is just in general skills that employers look for. Oral and written communication, rare these days because we're going to um, all these, uh, you know, texts and uh, I'm even losing it myself. To the texts and the Snapchats and all those things, you know, the ability to write and to speak well, very important. Um, I run up a lot of people and I, maybe I'm doing it myself that say like this, like, like, like every other word. It's very off-putting, especially to someone who is um, looking for somebody who can communicate well. Uh, people skills, relationship building in most jobs, leadership and management, teamwork, critical thinking, adaptability and flexibility, certainly in these days of COVID where that's, if, if nothing has shown it to us that that's an important skill, it's certainly, we're certainly all sensitive to that now. Creativity and knowledge and proficiency, of course, in your field of study, in the, in the field that you're going to go into. So you want to know the job, right? Take a look at the requirements of the job carefully. Um, what are they looking for so that you can match that to what you have and put those down on a piece of paper. I mean, the nice thing about, um, you know, not being in person, but although even in person, you can have a notebook and ask if you can write, you know, take notes. But beforehand, you should, you should write how you match that job in, in terms of their job requirements, the job specs. So before the interview, know the company. Look at how do you do that? You look on the company website. You look at their LinkedIn page, um, especially if you know who you're going to speak to. Look at their LinkedIn profiles, the person who's going to be or people that are going to be interviewing you. Look at annual reports and press releases. Annual reports, the beginning of the annual report where the president talks about, you know, what the strategy is for the new year, even before they get into the financials, is a very telling, interesting thing to to take a look at. It's only a few pages and um, it's, it's uh, an important thing to know. And if you're a finance person, you should look at the numbers, right? You wanna be able to know those numbers. And of course, an, another way of knowing the company is your contacts, people who work there, who could actually give you the skinny on what that place is really like. So the first question that you're going to be asked, and we all know this question, so um, you know we've always emphasized about doing this in advance, going through this, practicing it, and it will change through each interview. What it, you know, depending on the company, is your elevator pitch, right? The answer to tell me about yourself. So this is where usually it happens in the beginning, where you can say, okay, you're, you know, I'm interviewing, you know, you. Tell me why I should hire you. So because branding is so important, you don't want to just have it a repetition of your resume, which they've seen. You know, I went to this to Pace. I graduated in so-and-so. I majored in so-and-so, and I'm working here now. That doesn't really tell me about your brand. It doesn't really add to what I already know from this piece of paper. So you want to have one that says something like, Throughout my career, I've turned data into actionable insights that drove substantial new revenue. In my last company, XYZ, I was awarded the recognition as employee of the year. The reason I'm excited to speak with you today is because of your outstanding reputation for data analytics. So here you see it, it gives a little bit of accomplishments, um, a little bit tells a little bit about the person's brand and the excitement. Remember we talked, you know, I showed in the beginning, people hire you for three things. You can do the job um, and you're excited about it. You have a motivation, right? And, and, and the fit is, is something that usually requires, you know, more than just one interview to, to figure out whether you're a good fit. So it's something that's impressive, right? And it, as I said, it would probably change slightly with each type of job you're, you're going for, if it's a different function. Now, before you start, you know, just hop on um, and you, get, you have an important interview, this is your, your A-list company, 
you don't want to just hop on like Philip and I did before this. We, you know, we we wanted to make sure everything was working correctly. So that's why it's important for you to do this in, in advance. Um, so you want to download the soft swear, software well in advance of the interview. Um, test your internet connection. Make sure your battery is fully charged. Practice makes perfect. Do training, test calls with your friends to become more comfortable, if it's an, especially if it's an app that you haven't used before. Um, close any streaming during your interview as it may slow down your connection. Um, and conduct a quick test the morning of the interview to verify that the camera and the microphone are working properly. And also um, turn off your cell phone because you don't want your cell phone to ring uh, if you're going to use the, especially if you're going to use the audio on like this, this, you know, a Zoom call. So testing that out in advance is very important. Okay, so now you've done all that in, in preparation because preparation, as I said, is key to this. You don't just want to show up. So what happens the day of the interview? Now, this is a little pre-COVID, but just because it might turn around, we don't know. As soon as people get vaccinated in the next few months, I want you to think about this. You want to dress on the conservative side. Women wearing a, a skirt or pantsuit. Um, I know I, this is like a blinding flash of the obvious for most of you, but I would feel remiss um, if I don't go through it. I, I just remember being, um, we do a lot of, when, when um, the job fairs are in person at Pace, we do a lot of prepping people. We have, we have um, and, you know, training for that. And then people show up in cutoffs or hats or what have you. You know, and we look at each other, you know, or mini skirts, things that are just not appropriate for a work environment, for most work environments. And professional attire for women. Um, so you want to be, keep it on the conservative, even if you're going for like a, a Google where you can show up in your, your uh, pajamas just about. You don't want to show up in a suit for the interview, but, you, you know, you want to be business casual. Stay a little bit to the right of what they are. And this is certainly important person, uh, colognes, anything that's going to, you know, be po a possible turnoff to um, the, the um, employer. Um, and, and, and certainly don't smoke or chew gum, any kind of smoking, even if it's legal. No smoking or chewing gum. So, and dress appropriately for a particular industry. And that's, that's meaning if you're in advertising, it's something that's a little more casual, you know, you can be a little more casual, but make sure it's neat. You know, not a dirty t-shirt, at least something that's, you know, a collared shirt would be nice. And now, of course, we're all dressed on the top and God knows what you're wearing in the bottom, but it doesn't matter if this is what they see in a Zoom call. So, manage your time, um, even if it's, of course, this in person, you want to be 10 to 15 minutes early. You don't want to look rushed. You know, you know, whatever kind of means of transportation, if you're going there in person, can always be late. So you want to plan to arrive early, not, you know, out of breath. And this is the same thing on the Zoom, you know, in a Zoom, if it's a Zoom call or some kind of an app, you want to get on it early, test your mic, test your, your um, camera, um, and, and have a little bit of a breather to just relax, get your notes together. Be courteous to everyone. This is an in-person in thing, but it's, you know, everybody weighs in um, in, many, in many companies from the receptionist, the, you know, to, to the president. So you want to be courteous um, and like, you know, by everyone. Turn your cell phones off. We talk no dumb drinks. And you want to be able to get, engage in talk, small talk, because sometimes people hire you, you know, for personal reasons, not just business reasons. They, you know, they want to make sure that you're somebody that they maybe want to go to lunch with or be able to chat with. They don't have to love you, but, you know, somebody who's got some kind of a personality. And follow the lead of the interviewer. If the interviewer is just straightforward and formal, then you should have the same kind of tone. You should just stick, stick with this, you know, for, in, uh, formal tone. 
if they're more informal and want to shoot the breeze for a little bit, you know, do that with them, but make sure that you're going to, if they, you know, some of these interviewers are not great interviewers. So you should have certain points that you, if all else fails, you need to make these points about yourself. So if they want to talk, if you are a great baseball player and they want to talk about the, the uh, Mets or the Yankees the whole time, then you have to take the reins and bring it back to, yeah, that's great. You know, that's exciting, but I really, you know, I can't wait to talk to you about, you know, my candidacy in your company. And don't bring up salary. The first one to bring up salary loses. I teach a course in salary negotiation. Um, of course, if you're working through a recruiter, you know, recruiting agency, you're gonna have to tell them because they're the ones who, you know, they're working with the company. But you don't wanna share that until the end because right now at the beginning of the interview stage, you are a stranger. You have no power. They haven't invested anything in you. You haven't met the hiring manager. You have no negotiation power. So if they bring up salary, the answer to that is, I'm sure if the job is right, the salary is gonna be right. Because the first thing that you negotiate is job, is you try to grow the job. So if you're interviewing properly, especially for some of you experienced people, and you interview like a consultant, you're going to be asking a lot of questions about the job and not, not, not only about the job, but what's going on in the company. So if you can do more, especially if you're overqualified, if you can do what the job says, but also other things, and you hear them saying, well, we were also planning on doing, you know, growing this way or growing that way. In the interview, you'll be able to, it might not be the first interview, but the second interview, maybe you'll be able to add things that you have that will increase the job. So if the job specs are from A to G, you'll be able to bring it from A to M. And now at the end, at the end of that, you're talking about a different job. So the salary should be commensurate with that new job, that new expanded job. I had a, a person last week who was looking for a job as a production assistant. Um, it turned out that he could also write. He knew camera work and many other aspects of, of production. And because he was able to ask the recruiter about what was going on, what else they were looking for, he, he now was able to grow the job to do some of the things that he loved and he could do. And at the end, when he talked about salary, he was talking about a different job. So um, please don't bring up salary. As I said, they have nothing invested in you um, until later in the process. Okay, nonverbal, we're not shaking hands these days, but in future, hopefully, it won't be fist bumps, it'll be handshakes. A professional appearance. We talked about that eye contact. Remember, and it's hard for me to when you're um, you, the person is down here on the screen, but the camera is up here. You want to at least look up and try to look in, into that camera as much as possible to make eye contact. Your body language and posture. Sit up, right. You know, show that you're. You can smile. It won't hurt you to smile. And you know, if you're going to sit down here and not, you know, not project. It's not going to make, you're not going to project confidence, the confidence that they're looking for. So here are the types of interviews. Well, mostly we're talking about interviewing for employment. There's the telephone interview, which um, I guess is still happening, although I think most of most people are using screens. The one-on-one -on -one interview, um, question and answer, a panel, a panel where you're you know, speaking to more than one person, a high stress and case study where they're giving you cases and they want to see how you're thinking, if you can solve it. I hate those. <laughs> we all hate those. And over lunch, dinner, coffee, that's probably not going to happen now, um, unless you're going to be outside in one of these uh, shacks on the street. With, with noise, you know, the traffic noise, I doubt that's happening, but this is just all about making business, you know, business decisions um, by, by, for personal reasons, to see if you fit. That's all about fit, this, this dinner, lunch, and uh, 
don't order ribs. <laughs> That's my uh, big advice to you if you're going to be eating and interviewing at the same time. And then there's other int uh, interviews, those the informational interviews. This is where you're, you're trying to test whether the target is right for you. Uh, there's always an underlining, boy, it would be great if this person hired me. But those interviews are more to make an impression. Um, you're saying that you're not interviewing for a job, so you, that's not what you do. And I don't have time to really go into all that. But mostly the takeaway is that you're going to get referrals and good information whether this is the right field for you. Uh, this is where you could actually ask about what do people in this field make? You know, questions that you're not going to answer on a real interview. Um, what's a company culture like? What do you think about my resume? Um, you know, depending on who this informational interview is, is, is with. But that's a, a different form of, of, of interviewing. So the types of interview questions. Open-ended. Tell me about yourself. Okay, that's where... It's up to you to fill that in, right? You're going to be able to um, talk until they, you know, but just be really when you're, do, when you're asking an open-ended question, be aware of verbal cues. If you've talked too long, if you, if you see that the interviewer is looking away or if you're in person, they're looking down at your watch, it might be time to wrap it up. Close-ended, are you currently employed? Obviously, that's a yes or no answer. Behavioral based, tell me a time you faced a challenge. And that's why in the beginning, um, you know, I spoke about going through your background. When I, when you might want to relook, if you don't know what, you know, if, if you're having trouble with this part, um, you might want to look at the first thing I did on personal branding, where you're looking at times during your career where you, you know, where you did things that you're proud of, um, that you enjoyed, so that you can recall these stories so that they're on your fingertips when you, when you um, encounter something like this. Tell me about a time you faced a challenge. And then there's the analytical puzzle. How many times a day do a clock's hands overlap? I guess that's if you're an analytical job they wanna see about your math skills and your thinking skills. And technical questions, how, you, how familiar are, are you with Excel? So, you know, things that, sh that are probably on the job description. Okay, so these are very important that you speak this way. There's timid words, I think, if, I might be, I hope, I'll try. No, 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 you're not gonna go to those words, even if in, inside you're saying, I, them. I'll try, I hope, I wish, I, if, if, if you're saying that to yourself, keep it to yourself. The words that come out of your mouth have to be, I know, when, definitely, I will, I am. So you have to go into your role play mode here because if, if, if you're not confident, the interviewer, whether it's the new HR, um, you know, recruiting person or your hiring manager are, are not going to have the confidence to, to hire you. So it's very important that you exude confidence. It's, people are listening more to how you say something than what you say. I don't remember the figures, but 80%, at least I'm sure I remember, is how you say something as opposed to what you're saying. So make sure that you can do that. And if you can't, role play and do some practice interviews. And hopefully don't interview with your top dream job company first. You know. Go through this with some, you know, companies that you're really not that interested in, but just for practice. So it's not that, it's the other. Okay, there's always a question behind the question. And those questions are usually about, you know, how you're going to perform in the job. Um, so tell me about yourself. What's the question be behind that question? What are your key skills and attributes? What is your greatest weakness? I hate people who ask this question. What do you struggle with and what have you done to overcome it? Right? A lot of people answer it with, you know, uh, actually a strength. I tend to work too hard. Um, you know, something like that. I, I tend not to be able to delegate because I'm a perfectionist. But it's a weakness that can be interpreted 
as a strength. But really what they're looking for is, can you overcome diversity? Because, hey, most people who worked in the world know that everything's not going to go smoothly all the time. So the question is, how are you going to um, deal with that? Are you going to fall apart or are you going to be able to move on? Where do you want to be in five years? Do you set long-term goals? Are you driven and motivated? Right, that's what they, they're asking. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen in five years. No one knew that COVID was going to be around a year and a month or whatever it is, you know, ago. But they want to know that you have, that you're somebody who's, you know, a go-getter and somebody who has, an, you know, a career path for themselves. They're not looking at this as a, just a job. You have a career plan. And what did you most or least enjoy about your last job? So this is all about fit. Do you focus on positive or negative? Here, you don't, you know, sometimes you can't be totally transparent. If you hated your, your boss in the last job and that's the God's honest truth, you're not going to say that, right? You're not going to say the least thing I hated most was I, I couldn't get along with my boss. You have to have something that still shows that you're a good fit for that company. So maybe this company that you're interviewing with is one where you have a lot of autonomy. You have a lot of ways to use your creativity. The last job was either more micromanaged or was just like less room to grow and succeed. So that's a good thing to say. If you know that the culture here is kind of entrepreneurial, then talk about how you're more entrepreneurial. So that's um, sort of what they're getting at behind that question. Here's one of the biggest tricks. And I used it when I was in interviewing, when I was in, especially um, when I was in sales and had to know what, the, you know what was behind the buyer's mind. To buy yourself time, you could always say, would you please say more about this? So rather than give a bad knee-jerk reaction, which sometimes we're prone to do if we're nervous, you want to say, would you say more about this? They're not going to say no. I'm not going to say more. They'll start asking that question in a different way. And the different way might, A, it's going to buy you time to think your answer, but it also might give you a little bit more insight into what they're trying to ask about. So, because, you know, they're not used to being asked that all the time. So um, in any of those questions before, you know, let, let's say, you know, something that you're not sure how to answer, just say, you know, could you please say a little bit more about that in a conversational way? And this might give you just the chance to be able to frame a good response. So you want to, as I say, practice, right? You don't want to have your best company, your most important interview be the first time you've ever tried to interview. So you practice, tell me about yourself. I'm gonna give you another example. I'm a business development professional with over 10 years in the consumer products industry. I pride myself in having always met or exceeded sales goals. In my last company, I was selected as salesperson of the year, having exceeded my goals by 200%. The reason I'm excited to speak to you today is because I know you are the leader in the industry and have an excellent reputation of allowing employees to reach their potential. So maybe you don't have as glowing a pitch as this person, but you, you do the best you can, right? You, you, you give it, you know, in terms of you're selling yourself. So you give this best sales pitch about yourself that you can, whatever you feel is impressive. And you could work with a career counselor to, you know, come up with something that, that, um, that maybe will work for you. So tell me something about yourself. Some, these are the things that people include, their school, their year, their major, area of interest, and relevant experience. If you're someone who's just coming out of school or most of you are at least a year out, yes, it might be important to focus on your, you know, what major and your area of interest. Um, that still is relevant, right? How you did in school, if you were in the dean's list and you always, you know, you've been in the dean's list multiple times, um, you know, a great project that you did if you don't have a, any work experience. 
or an internship. If you are a seasoned person, you really don't talk about school anymore. As an employer or recruiter, I'm more interested to hear about your empl employment, what your experience is, especially if you have any relevant experience to the job that you're interviewing for. <clears throat> and skills and attribute statements tailored to the position. Always tailor it to this position. Behavioral interview questions. Give me an example of how you utilized your organizational skills. Tell me about a time you had to handle difficult situations with someone. What is the greatest decision you've had to make within the last six months? Describe a time when you successfully balanced completing priorities. Now, are you gonna be asked all these questions? No, I'm just giving you examples. Um, can you figure out every single behavioral question in the world and, and, and get an answer? No, it's impossible. I will, though, uh, this is a special promotion for those of you listening. Um, we, we do have the 16, 16 frequently asked questions along with good answers. And um, I'm going to send that to Philip to distribute. So if you're interested, um, the people on this call today, I'm going to, uh, I think I have that in my data bank. I'm, I'll, I will send it to him and um, he can disseminate it to you. Uh, th these are really good. They're, you know, maybe you're going to have to probably customize those answers, but at least you will um, be able to to look at them and see. Okay, um, you know, so the the whole the whole thing is that you're as prepared as possible. Of course, there's as I said, you always get a, a curveball that you're not expecting. A lot of people are asking these days. At the end, tell me about something that I haven't asked you. Tell me about something about you that I haven't asked you. You might want to be prepared with that because I know a few recruiter friends who like to ask that because there's no way that they can cover all the bases. And it gives you an opportunity to, you know, sell yourself a little bit more. So you're nervous, right? So how do you frame these accomplishment questions? We like to use what was called a star, the star technique. So it's very similar to the bullet points. We talked about this when we talked about writing a resume. What was the situation you, you, know, you faced? What was the task you were assigned? What action did you take? And what was the result? Okay, situation, task, action, and result. Some people just stop with action and not tell them the result. You know, as a result of my efforts, this is how many newspapers we sold. That's the most, sometimes the most important part if it's a quantitative job. So practice, give me an example of, a, of uh, how you utilized your organizational skills. The situation, I faced a challenge during my first year as a graduate student at Pace University. That was their problem. Task, my teacher assigned a project but required advanced Excel skills, but I only knew basic Excel skills. So what did the person do? What was the action? I scheduled appointments with my professor to identify skills I needed to improve. And then I went to the tutoring center to receive additional help. And as a result, once I learned the key skills, I was able to complete the project and earn a 97%. Now this is geared more to students, but it would be the same thing on a job. Maybe it's writing. You are called into, you know, you, you're called to task because your writing isn't good. So maybe you hired a writing coach just to get you through. Um, it, it's just something that you did that shows that you took action and, and, you know, as a result of your efforts, this is what happened. Okay, so that's a good, it's a good framework for you so that you're not all over the place thinking about how to succinctly answer this, this uh, the question. Describe a time when you successfully balanced competing priorities. Same thing, what was the situation, task, okay, questions. All right, whoops, that works. Um, so, you know, you'd go through the same thing. This was the situation where I, there was, you know, there's many things coming at me. The task was to be able to prioritize. The action I took was be able to say what was the most important thing for the business. I'm just shooting from the hip here. And the, as a result of that, everything was able to work smoothly and we're able to get everything done. 
Okay, questions to the employer. Remember, we said this is a two-way street. You're expected to have questions. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you're not gonna be a good candidate if you don't have questions. It means that you didn't do your homework and you don't know anything about this company and you don't think too much about yourself either. I love this question. I love to ask actually this question early on in an interview. And I'll tell you why. Um, what is your vision of success? What, or in six months time, how would you know, you know that the person is successful? Because the reason that we wanna hear the person articulate the vision is that when people start to, when a company starts to interview, they don't know what's gonna show up, right? And they have a, an idea of their mind of what the perfect candidate might be, but they're not sure. And it starts to change, right? I interviewed John, then I interview Mary. Mary is good. Oh, I didn't know that if you get somebody who knew Excel, then I interview someone else. So I've got a vision in my head of the ideal person um, and what they're, what they're about. So if you ask this question early on, what's your vision of a successful candidate? At the end, First of all, you know what points that you have to make about yourself to be in line with that, what, what this vision is. And at the end, you can say, well, gee, you had mentioned that you were looking for somebody who could do X, Y, and Z. I hope I've demonstrated that I can do X, Y, and Z. Do you feel that way? You know, so get their, their take on it. But at least you know what they're looking for and you don't go in the wrong direction. Please describe the training and evaluation. How will I be evaluated? Um, the, uh, another point that I, I don't think I made in the PowerPoint, but if you're getting, if you're, let's say, overqualified and you're, the pay is going to be lower, but they're still willing to go, not, not at the first, not this round, but later when they, when you, um, uh, you know, are later on in, in the process, um, you might say, well, you know, this is after they've made you the offer, which is when you have power, you might say, can I get, they might not change the starting salary, but you say, can I get a six or three or six month review? Because I'm confident I'm going to do a good job. This might be a way of having your salary bump sooner than waiting for a year. What type of supervision will I receive? You know, that's important. Um, are there opportunities for career advancement? So you want to at least know these things at the very least. What is the work atmosphere like at, at, you know, at your company? You might ask them that, or you might wait you know, till, till later rounds. Because in, in all probability, this is not a one and done. You're going to go through a screening interview, then you're going to go through a, you know, people do seven, sometimes, unfortunately, someone was just telling me that their son went through seven interviews in a presentation before they got a job. Not to discourage you, but that's why it's really important to interview like a consultant and know, you know, what what um, what the vision is and try to grow the grow the job so you're kind of killing the horrible word, but you know, getting rid of the competition so you're, you know, when when it comes down to it, you're really the only one and you have you know a lot of power. What are the next steps in the interviewing process? You don't want to go away dumb and happy. You want to make sure that, you know, with that vision question that, you know, that they're, if you, if they have an objection that they voice it, if they can, like, well, you're really not the vision and they tell you it, at least you won't go away dumb and happy. Maybe you can address it there or in a follow-up. Um, and always assume you're going to the next step. Remember the confidence. So what are the next steps in the interview process? You assume that you're going to move forward. So you want to know what the next steps are. Don'ts. Don't ask or answer questions about. I hope you will know this, but age, you don't want to ask or answer questions about that. You don't have to. Race, sexual orientation, religion, marital status, children, and don't ask about salary or benefits in this interview, right? You don't want to ask about it until you get the job and then you negotiate. You negotiate base salary first and all kinds of benefits afterwards because now you're the probably the only person left standing and they want you. Um, they've gone through this whole process and you have much more power. But don't ask about it. I mean, I remember this person that I was interviewing asking 
on the first round, um, you know, how many days off do I get? Because this is why I need days off. And you don't, you don't do that. Okay, follow-up begins at the end of the interview. Um, always ask two questions at the end. Are you interviewing other candidates? And how do I measure up against the others you're seeing? You have every right to ask that question, right? You wanna know, are there a thousand people for this job? Are there five people? And how, how do you measure up? Because you, you're gonna need to be able to, you know, to um, address that in a, in a, if not then and there, then in a follow-up. And how do you feel about moving forward with my candidacy? I really wouldn't say that. This is not my, um, I would rather say it like, what's the next step in the interview process? After the interview. Okay, thank the interviewer or, or interviewers for their time. Get a business card or contact information, even if it's by Zoom, ask them to put it in a chat box for you. Um, do some self-assessment, note what you did well, identify what you could have done better so that you learn from this. Um, always send a note within 24 hours and you wanna follow up. I don't like the thank you card thing, so I'm gonna to talk to you about that. I think a thank you notice for your aunt, right? I liked you, thanks for the time, I had a good time, all that stuff. It doesn't improve your chances. We're always taking every opportunity here to improve your chances. So what I like to call it is an influence note. You wanna reinforce your enthusiasm for the job, restate your skills and experiences, remind them of your value, and also you wanna even quote them. If they said to you, wow, you really did, that's amazing that you were able to you know, work full-time and also go to school full-time, for instance, you remind them, thank you, for recognizing that it was that I was able to go to school full time and work full time. It wasn't easy and I appreciate your recognition of that because they're busy. They might forget that they said such a wonderful thing about you. So you wanna reinforce and restate that. And include information you forgot to mention in the interview. So maybe they'll say, you know, gee, you know, I really, you know, I think you're a terrific candidate, but I don't really think you have enough experience with whatever it is and you're nervous and you can't think of the experience that you had, but you, then when you think about it, you say, oh my goodness, I should have said such and such. Well, here's your chance in this influence note. Here's your chance to say, gee, you know, I, I forgot to mention that I do have experience with creating PowerPoint presentations. I did it in my, uh, sales and marketing class or in my, in my job is whatever it is, you know, you fill in the blanks. So this is your, this is, a, this is an influence note, not just a thank you note. Follow up, send, send a follow up email within six to 10 business days, um, just to make sure, hey, you're out there. Keep the follow up very brief. And Really don't fly, it's, it's very difficult, but don't be for frustrated if they're slow to respond. People are just slower than it used to be. The whole process takes longer than it used to. Um, it doesn't mean that they have ruled you out. Common interview mistakes, not researching, preparing or practicing, not having clear goals or direction, not providing evidence and examples. Remember those power of storytelling. Um, please review the that first um, session on personal branding, if you need to go through that. And inability to express your thoughts clearly. Okay. And I'm gonna leave you with this, this one uh, quote that I like, one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is preparation. So I hope you will all prepare be confident and, and do well in your interviews. So with that, I'm going to stop.